episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to uh, another episode of our show with another fascinating guest and a really interesting discussion today. Uh, as those that watch the show know, uh, the last couple episodes, we have uh, ventured into the area of uh, the topic of uh, directing energy, primarily from a healthcare perspective, talking about topics like optogenetics, electroceuticals, uh, ways that potentially in the future uh, companies, pharmaceutical companies and so forth can use various energy sources uh, instead of pills or injections or, or a lot of the typical healthcare modalities nowadays. Today, we're going to be talking about directed energy from a, a different but equally fascinating perspective. Uh, we have the honor today of being joined by Dr. David Stout, uh, who is Senior Executive Advisor and Engineering Fellow for Directed Energy uh, at the consulting firm Booz Allen Hamilton, uh, where he's responsible for providing clients with leadership and guidance on the science and the business of advancing directed energy capabilities for American warfighters. Uh, Dr. Stout is also the president of the Directed Energy Professional Society. Uh, he holds a bachelor's, master's, and a PhD uh, from Old Dominion University in Electrical Engineering and spent the last 32 years serving in the Department of the Navy. 12 of them uh, as the Navy's first distinguished engineer for directed energy, which was an executive position where he was responsible for establishing and staffing uh, uh, directed energy programs and facilities at the Naval Surface Warfare Center. From 2008 to 2012, Dr. Stout was the first Naval Sea Systems Command Technical Authority warrant for directed energy and electric weapon systems, including high energy lasers, uh, the electromagnetic rail gun, and high power microwave weapon systems. Uh, at the Naval Surface Warfare Center, he established and technically directed a number of high high power microwave and high energy laser technology programs, including airborne electronic attack, uh, counter improvised explosive devices and the beginning of the Navy, Navy's laser weapon systems currently deployed uh, on the Austin class amphibious transport dock ship, the USS Ponce. Uh, Dr. Stout established several prototype weapon development uh, initiatives aimed at mitigating the impact of uh, improvised explosive devices during Operation Iraqi Freedom. Uh, and these resulted in a range of prototypes represented the first ever uh, tactical uh, deployment of directed energy weapons. Uh, as Senior Director for Capabilities and Concepts of the Office of the Deputy Undersecretary of the Navy for Policy from 2011 to 2015, uh, Dr. Stout initiated and served as the Executive Secretary for the Directed Energy Steering Group, uh, which was chartered by the Undersecretary of the Navy to develop the uh, Department of Navy Vision and Strategy and Roadmap uh, for the Future of Directed Energy Weapons. Uh, Dr. Stout also established and served the Executive uh, Secretary for both the Navy Non-Acoustic Anti-Submarine Warfare Steering Group and the Naval Space board, uh, chartered by the Undersecretary of the Navy and the Secretary of the Navy, respectively. Among his honors, Dr. Stout has received multiple meritorious civilian service awards, uh, the Navy Distinguished and Superior Civilian Service Award, and the Naval Sea Systems Command Scientist of the Year Award. Uh, Dr. David Stout, uh, thanks for taking the time to come on the show. Thank you, Ira, and good morning. It's, it's great to have you here. Um, I, I'd uh, love to start off by uh, just sort of handing you uh, the floor for a few minutes to talk a little bit about uh, your career trajectory uh, in both government and the private sector now, and, and a little bit on uh, how you got interested in the whole area of directed energy uh, early on in your career and sort of became the laser uh, electromagnetic weapons guy at the Navy. You know, great, great way to start things off. Sure, uh, happy to. And, and I guess... Um... You know, I thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about this, um, you know, exciting topic with our audience. And uh, I'd also like to say that, you know, direct energy weapons, meaning high energy lasers and high power microwave systems, you know, are no longer a weapon of the future. Uh, in fact, uh, both types of direct energy weapons have either already been fielded or in the process of being fielded today. So this is a very current topic. Um, so for myself, uh, I was born outside of uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, my mom did everything from uh, being a stay-at-home mom to a, um, you know, owning and operating a small town gift shop to being a traveling saleswoman back in the 1960s. Uh, my dad was a World War II and Korean War Navy veteran uh, who worked as a machinist and tool and die maker uh, after his uh, 16 years in the Navy. So uh, both my parents only had eighth grade educations um, because they grew up during the uh, Great Depression. 
but they were both very hardworking and uh, and uh, very smart. So, uh, and I certainly owe a lot to them. So after I graduated uh, high school, uh, I went to Penn State for a year. Uh, that didn't really work out too well. So I joined the Navy in 1978 and served aboard a, a fast tech submarine as an electronics technician, as a nuclear reactor operator, as a Navy scuba diver, and as a periscope photographer. So I kept uh, volunteering for things when I was uh, when I was in the Navy. So I got out after six years as a first class petty officer in E6. You know, and I remember even back in those days uh, watching the first Star Wars movies. Uh, on an old reel-to-reel -reel projector that they would set up in the chow hall on the submarine uh, while we were underway. And even then being fascinated by the uh, laser systems on the Imperial cru cruisers uh, and uh, the Starfleet ships of the original Star Trek series. So even back then, I think I was already fascinated in this topic. Um, so, you know, after the Navy, I got out of the Navy and I immediately uh, enrolled at uh, Old Dominion University and since the Navy got me interested in electronics, uh, I decided to study electrical engineering and uh, ended up graduating summa cum laude and as a valedictorian of the College of Engineering in 87. So I can also say that the educational training that I received in the Navy's nuclear power program had a massive positive impact on both my academic and professional careers. So um, as an undergraduate, I was invited to be a research assistant to Dr. Carl Schoenbach and his high power gaseous electronics laboratory. So basically we're working to develop very high power opening switches that uh, you know, you know, operated 50 to 100,000 volts and we're carrying thousands of amps of current, uh, which uh, certainly is a lot more than what you'd be accustomed to in your home. And I could say that this work for Dr. Schoenbach really kind of, uh, you know, got me hooked into pulse power uh, technologies and really uh, laid the foundation for my career in directed energy. So I continued at ODU uh, with my master's degree in electrical engineering under Dr. Carl Schoenbach. Uh, my thesis now being using uh, energetic electron beams to control uh, semiconductor switches basically switching megawatts of power in nanoseconds or microseconds uh, timeframes. So, you know, after uh, graduating my master's, I started at uh, the Naval Surface Warfare Center in Dalton, Virginia. Uh, and I initially started working on a high power laser controlled semiconductor switch, uh, otherwise known as a bulk optically controlled semiconductor switch, uh, which was actually initially patented by Dr. Schoenbach. So after a couple of years at NSWC, uh, they actually sent me back to ODU on uh, really what amounted to a, a full ride scholarship uh, to get my PhD uh, again under Dr. Schoenbach uh, as my advisor studying the speed and power limitations of that BOSS technology. And it was kind of interesting because, you know, if you can think of a, of a very resistive block of a semiconductor, you hit it with one, uh, color laser, if you will, one wavelength, and you close the switch so it starts to conduct kill lamps. You hit it with another laser at a different wavelength and it actually would interrupt the flow of current. So it was both fast closing, fast opening, and it would do that in about 100 picoseconds. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's pretty interesting technology. And the reason I was looking at it as being part of, uh, you know, being a Navy civilian at NSWC, was I was looking at the technology from the standpoint of whether or not it could be used to develop a high power microwave source that could be very uh, frequency tailorable, you know? So basically a direct energy weapon. So, you know, everything I studied after leaving the Navy, um, you know, ended up covering a lot of topics that in hindsight related to direct energy weapons. I can't say at that point in time, that that was my long-term goal and plan, but it just sort of worked out that way. But I mean, studying high power electromagnetics, solid state and laser physics, gaseous electronics, pulse power technologies, high-speed diagnostics and things like that, you know, were all very applicable to, to the rest of my career. So following the completion of my PhD in 95, I decided, <coughs> excuse me, I was going to uh, start to grow a team at Dahlgren and try to develop uh, directed energy weapons because it seemed to me, 
that the evolution of kinetic weapons, meaning missiles and, and guns, uh, were not going to keep pace uh, with the evolving threats that were, uh, that were on the horizon. So um, initially we focused on high power microwave devices, started with about a half a dozen folks and a uh, kind of build a little, test a little mentality. Turned out we were very successful at formulating concepts and securing funding for our research and development. You know, our cable small team grew in size significantly over the years, eventually branching out to uh, high energy laser systems as well. Uh, and uh, currently, I think the team is over 200 people, 200 government uh, civilians in Dahlgren, and uh, probably at least half that many on-site contractors. And actually, Booz Allen uh, is the primary support contractor uh, for those efforts. So, uh, you know, our talented team and Gore enjoyed a, um, a great number of successes, I would say. Uh, some I could talk about, some I can't. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, I like to think that the primary reason for our successes was uh, that focus in providing capabilities to the warfighter. So, you know, uh, you know, very fundamental uh, tenant uh, that we followed in those days, and I think it continues today, was that our technical integrity was absolutely paramount. And, uh, you know, I made that very clear to everybody we brought on board. And the way a warfare center is funded, if you didn't deliver what you promised, then the money stopped flowing. So uh, much as it is for industry. <laughs> so, uh, you know, after I retired and joined Booz Allen, as you said, I provide uh, leadership and guidance on the science of business of directed energy. I also helped drive the agenda for the Booz Allen Direct Energy Summit uh, that we put on uh, prior to, to the COVID pandemic every spring. We bring a lot of senior leadership to talk about uh, where where the field direct energy is, and it's not just the technical folks getting together as they might do uh, with a direct energy professional society, but really it's a very senior leadership in the department and government to make sure there's a synergy on where the technical community is going and, and where the operational needs lie. And of course, I also continue to, to work with and mentor a lot of our younger scientists and engineers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Outstanding, outstanding. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a fa fascinating background and a fascinating uh, portfolio of, uh, of things that you're working on uh, in, in the Booz Allen practice. Um, I, like you, uh, was a child of the, the 60s and 70s, grew up on Star Trek and Star Wars and so forth, but my extent is, yeah, I, I love to see the lasers go off and, and things, see things explode, but after that, don't think much about it as, as you have to. Could you um, sort of a, at a very basic level, um, because you know, you're involved in a high energy lasers, but also you point out offline sort of the high power microwaves as well. Uh, take us on, on a little journey through sort of where we are in terms of uh, the, str the strengths and the, and the weaknesses around these various concepts and ultimately deploying them. Obviously, uh, lasers and microwaves, unlike, say, uh, bombs and missiles, uh, maybe require a substantial amount more of energy, of course, to work that energy weapons. At the same time, you know, you have to obviously do less rare earth mining and, 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 and all the intricacies that go into making a kinetic weapon. Talk a little bit about some of the strengths and weaknesses and the issues that you have to deal with in thinking of these new prototypes. Uh, sure, um, you know, so, you know, first of all, you know, kind of the, the definition of a direct energy weapon is um, basically the application of force on a target with electromagnetic energy, vice kinetic energy. In other words, uh, there is no projectile. So uh, you mentioned in my bio, the electromagnetic railgun. Mm -hmm. So that uh, is an electric weapon, but not a direct energy weapon because it actually launches a projectile at a target. So the, the classes of direct energy weapons, you know, include the high power microwave or, you know, really high power radio frequency weapons since it really covers more than the microwave band. Uh, you have the high energy lasers, and then you have the charge and neutral particle beams uh, as well. But I'm not, I'm not really going to talk about those. Their maturity is, is not to the point where they're uh, starting to see uh, service in the field. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the attributes of these uh, weapon systems, um, you know, both uh, microwave and lasers, uh, you know, they both travel at the speed of light. So the speed of light delivery but as I like to point out, it's uh, not speed of light 
destruction, right? So mm -hmm. you can get the, the energy to the target uh, very quickly, but unlike what the movies show that as soon as the laser hits the target, it blows up. You know, we wish it were that effective, but, uh, you know, at least for lasers, it actually requires a dwell time on the target to deposit sufficient energy to create the desired effect. Uh, other things, precise engagement, particularly for laser systems, you know, you have to put a spot on the target and you have to hold it there until you get the desired effect. So that takes uh, a, a complex system to do that and uh, compensation for atmospheric effects and things like that, uh, that that happen to a laser beam as it travels from the weapon system to the target. Um, graduated effects is another, uh, you know, uh, capability in terms of our ability to dial the output of the uh, system, whether it's microwaves or lasers, uh, you know, on a, on a missile, you basically shoot the missile and it blows up and that's it. So uh, for lasers, you could turn the power up or down depending on what you want uh, to create at the target. So depth of magazine is often uh, loaded as a capability for these, cap these weapons, um, you know, because virtually all direct energy weapons today are electrically driven. So as long as you have electricity, which normally equates to diesel fuel, uh, you have uh, bullets. Um, so, uh, and then uh, those bullets, you know, are actually very cheap. So they have a very low engagement uh, cost. Uh, so once the weapon is deployed, and I don't want to understate the cost of doing that, but once the weapon system is on a platform, actually using it in combat, uh, is very cost effective and, and offers a very good cost exchange ratio. And what that means is that, um, you know, if you had a, uh, a uh, UAV or a drone coming at you and say it costs $400 for an enemy to make, uh, if you had to shoot a $300,000 missile at that drone to shoot it down, that's a very poor cost exchange. We're spending a lot more to shoot it down than they are to send it at us. You compare that now to a laser system, for example, where you might spend less than $5 to shoot it down versus what they spent to send it at you, send it towards you, that's a very good cost exchange ratio. So hopefully that's that's clear. So, you know, you know, these are very common attributes to direct energy weapons, but they actually come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. You know, you could have large high average power CW lasers or continuous wave lasers or uh, microwave systems which tend to uh, have a very high power draw, cooling requirements and things that go along with them, which make them difficult to integrate into uh, operational platforms. You can have small uh, lasers, uh, dazzlers, or uh, HPM jammers, if you will. Uh, you could have uh, high energy pulse laser systems or pulse HPM or extremely high uh, peak power, ultra short pulse lasers and uh, very heat, high peak power uh, HPM system. So it's pretty complex. There's a lot of options out there and it really depends on what you want to do with the capability. So, you know, the way uh, HPM affects a target is by coupling energy either into an intended, and I'll talk about HPM first and then I'll talk about lasers. Um, so the HPM, you know, you can couple into the front door uh, of a target system, uh, if, and that's you know, a, a, if it had an RF aperture or an antenna that's on that uh, on that target, like a missile seeker, for example, or you might couple through you know cracks, seams, non-conductive surfaces, unshielded wires, and the like, and that's called backdoor coupling, right? So the uh, the intent of the HPM energy is to damage or disrupt the operation of the electronic circuits inside the target. Okay. So, um, you know, as I like to say, uh, in principle, all electronic devices uh, can be disrupted or damaged uh, by microwave energy. Uh, the key is, uh, you know, if a sufficient uh, power density can be uh, placed on that target to create those effects at operationally useful ranges. And then that has to be done with a, with a system with an HPM weapon that is realistic uh, in terms of a military point of view. So, you know, you, you know, it doesn't uh, do any good to say that I can damage this target if I have to be 10 feet away from it, right? If that's not operationally useful. So, so I really have to have that balance uh, when you talk about HPM effects. Uh, and unlike lasers, which kind of like you can think of a laser pointer stays a, a small spot for long distances, microwave energy spreads out very quickly as it leaves mm -hmm. the antenna of the weapon system. 
And if you think about it in terms of optical frequencies, uh, often folks use a flashlight as the analogy. If you compare a laser pointer to a flashlight, you know, the flashlight beam expands out fairly rapidly. Uh, and that's sort of the way it works with, uh, with microwaves, which, uh, and, you know, so laser can remain a small spot on a target, but, you know, a microwave, uh, you know, will, will spread out significantly as it propagates away from the weapon system. And that, uh, that, that spreading actually re reduces the power density on target, which we call range loss. And uh, the power density measured on the target, typically in watts per square centimeter, uh, decreases with one over the range squared or the electric field. Volts per meter decreases with the range linearly. And uh, so this hurdle that an HPM weapon has to overcome compared to a high-energy laser is how do you get sufficient power density on target at a range that is operationally useful, right? Mm -hmm. so, uh, so that is a critical aspect of an HPM weapon system. But if you can achieve the power levels, meaning if you have a very high power source, which, uh, which you know, have been developed during the process of being developed, uh, you end up covering a very broad area with that energy at range. So, you know, you could have a diameter spot size the size of a football field mm -hmm. at a kilometer, right? So, you know, if you think about uh, things like a, uh, you know, drone swarm, right, a manned okay. aerial system, a swarm of them, you can imagine you can engage a large number of them at one time, right? And um, so uh, such, a, such a capability is actually was just reported recently in the news, um, uh, which is a, a counter drone capability that is a joint effort with the Army and uh, the Air Force named THOR, which stands for Tactical High Power Operational Responder. Um, which is a high power microwave weapon system that repetitively generates very short pulses at extremely high peak power densities to engage drones at kilometer ranges, mm -hmm. right? Or, you know, multiple kilometers. So uh, again, as I said, that beam spreading out quickly, you cover a very large area. So even if you have multiple drones coming at you, um, you have the ability uh, to address them at, at the same time. And the other thing that's interesting um, when comparing and contrasting lasers to microwaves is that, you know, while a laser requires a dwell time on target to create a desired effect, uh, microwave effects are, are very quick, you know, usually a very small fraction of a second. Mm. Uh, so you can imagine actually painting the sky and, and knocking out multiple drones uh, when you do that. So it's critical. Uh, aspects of the HPM weapons is the output power, the size of the antenna, the distance required for a given scenario, and uh, ultimately the required power density on target. And, you know, HPM lethality drone uh, studies are, are studies of, of drones are ongoing right now. It's a complex process, but in most case, cases, like I said, that engagement time is very short. And, uh, and you could engage uh, a large number of drones you know, in a short period of time. So uh, another type of HPM weapon, uh, one that we developed at the Naval Surface Warfare Center in Dahlgren involved addressing the problem of roadside bombs, mm -hmm. uh, which were called uh, improvised explosive devices. Um, and I led the, the government contractor team on the development eventual deployment of the neutralization of IDs with RF or NERF program uh, that we uh, developed uh, in Dahlgren to, to counter IEDs in Iraq. So, you know, the concept uh, was that we would basically drive down the road, we would emit a lot of uh, HPM energy in front of us and, and blow up IEDs at ranges that probably wouldn't make our parents uh, very comfortable. <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, the system was built for the Marine Corps and the decision to fund it uh, was made by then Secretary of the Navy, uh, General Gordon England. And, uh, you know, when we initially approached the Secretary of the Navy, we really had nothing more than a concept design and some HPM uh, effects data that we took in a very rapid fashion to justify the design. So 13 months uh, after we received uh, the requested funding, 
the team produced the highest power RF um, system that had ever been put on wheels. So, um, you know, and a few months later, after successful uh, testing uh, NERF in the desert out in Yuma, Arizona, myself and 15 volunteers, uh, both Navy civilian and contractors, uh, flew directly from Yuma to Iraq in those very large C-5 aircraft um, with our system along with spares to support the, the capability in theater. So very, uh, very exciting and I'll say stressful time. <laughs> so uh, the, the reason NERF was so successful though, uh, and, and it basically performed exactly as we told the Secretary of the Navy that it would, is the approach that we took to, to uh, designing and developing the system. It's something we call effects-based design, meaning you know we studied the targets, uh, we evaluated um, you know what what waveform parameters, frequencies, pulse formats would be required uh, to create the desired effect, and then from there we went back to a system in a particular operational scenario. And, and came up with the hardware required to do it. And, and it was a very large vehicle, it was armored, um, you know, 90, 92 feet long. <laughs> so it was a tractor trailer system, uh, carrying a lot of power and a lot of cooling and a lot of uh, RF source technology. So, you know, I can, I can say that, you know, being contacted initially by DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency mm -hmm. uh, and asked uh, if Direct Energy could do anything to help with the IED problem in Iraq to formulating an amazing and dedicated team of scientists and engineers of both uh, government and, and contractors. And then designing, building, testing, failing, fixing, <laughs> successfully testing, and then ultimately deploying uh, with my team to Iraq to operate the system on combat missions was uh, probably one of the best, uh, most rewarding experiences of my uh, professional career. And, you know, the team basically worked seven days a week for those 13 months to develop that system. So, you know, it stayed in Iraq for three years, from 2005 to 2008. Uh, my civilian team maintained and operated uh, the vehicle in combat with military security detail on route clearance missions, uh, blowing up IDs and uh, IEDs in Iraq. And like I, like you mentioned in the bio, to my knowledge, uh, NERF was the first ever uh, operationally deployed and used in combat directed energy weapon. So, um, you know, we built a second NERF and deployed it and even stationary variants of, of, of the technology and deployed those as well. So I was very proud to lead this team and uh, many of us met the requirements to be awarded the Secretary of Defense Medal for the Global War on Terrorism uh, because of the time we spent in Iraq on operational missions. So, you know, during uh, the NERF program in 2004 is when I was appointed by the Secretary of Navy to be uh, the first uh, Navy Distinguished Engineer for Direct Energy, which is an executive ST position. Uh, and I had that position until I retired in 2015, and it is now held by uh, Dr. Frank Peterkin, who was somebody I hired back in the 1990s uh, when he was working as a postdoc with Dr. Schoenbach at ODU. So when I'm mentoring uh, younger scientists, engineers, or, or some would say lecturing, uh, you know, I'd like to tell them that I actually did train my replacement, you know, something that all senior technical folks are asked to do and, and in fact should do and trains a, a tough word. I think it's, you know, I would call it more of a very close collaboration over an entire time uh, together. So, you know, to, to switch over to laser, uh, energy laser systems, you know, they, they affect targets by depositing energy, much like a blowtorch does mm -hmm. on a particular part of a target. So careful lethality investigations uh, will determine the laser aim point, the amount of energy deposited uh, that, that creates the, uh, the desired outcome. And as I said, unlike the movies, it's, it's not an instantaneous effect. So, you know, like I said, we were mostly just doing high power microwave systems at that point in time, but, uh, you know, we had another uh, very smart uh, PhD on a team named Dr. Brian Hankley that we hired from the University of Nebraska. And he was an early addition to the team and worked, on our, uh, worth the, worked with us on our HPM systems in the 1990s. One day he came to me and said he was interested in high energy lasers and was interested in trying to build them. So I said, okay, <laughs> let me see what I could do, right? Um, 
So, you know, within a handful of months, I found myself as the uh, chair of the, uh, you know, Office of Secretary of Defense Joint Technology Office for High Energy Laser, Lethality, Technical Area Working Group. So it's a mouthful. But basically, it was a, uh, a funded group under the, the JTO to, uh, to look at uh, high energy laser lethality studies. And we basically set up a three-way split of the funding between the services. And um, I ended up bringing back about $2 million a year to Dahlgren and handed it to Brian and congratulated him for now being in charge of the Navy's uh, high energy laser lethality program. So, uh, you know, Brian and I then work within uh, Captain Dave Keel, program manager of PMS 405, to have uh, NSWC Dahlgren be given the lead to build the Navy's uh, laser weapon system or LAWS, which was a 30 kilowatt continuous wave laser. And Brian led the, de the early development of the law systems, which was built uh, by the government team and Dahlgren, uh, obviously with significant contractor support. Eventually, in 2014, Laws was operationally fielded on the USS Ponce and remained there for three years. And Laws was actually, in fact, the first high-energy laser uh, weapon that was ever operationally fielded by the U.S. Navy. So I could go on and discuss many other direct energy uh, concepts out there, you know, airborne electronic attack, vehicle vessel stopping, and others. Uh, but I'll leave it at that. That's it's a, it's an amazing. Uh... It's an amazing portfolio of possibilities. Um, you know, the one thing that comes to my mind, you know, you know, when you're talking about things like the IED process, or as you're saying, sort of spreading uh, a, a wide area for a variety of threats that may be uh, inbound, um, it makes me think of, uh, and once again, as a civilian, sort of the uh, the stuff that's coming in a lot faster uh, from a from a defensive perspective. Um, we spent a lot of time on the the topic of artificial intelligence on shows lately. We, we talked to Brett Vaughn at the Navy uh, about the AA programs there, the Jake at the Pentagon. Could you talk a little bit about sort of when you have some of the, the defensive applications, a, a missile coming in or something coming really fast, um, how some of these new tools, whether it's artificial intelligence, machine learning or something of that nature, uh, may be synergistic with uh, directed energy technologies uh, for uh, dealing with such threats? Uh, sure, sure. And again, you know, it depends on the, on the application. Um, there are both uh, offensive and defensive applications. Sure. And, and no, no uh, defensive weapon system is a panacea. So our silver bullet, um, you know, for all future and imagined uh, threats that a wolf riders are going to face. So you know, properly understanding the capabilities and limitations of those weapon systems is very key. Mm -hmm. As required, if, uh, we're going to integrate them with other existing capabilities in, in a layer of defense. Uh, and, and the layer of defense, I'll get back to when I, when I talk about um, how AI and ML, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning might, might play into that. Great. So, um, you know, because ultimately it's going to be the integration of these new direct energy capabilities with electronic warfare capabilities, with kinetic capabilities in this layer of defense uh, that, um, that's going to, going to result in, in an effective uh, uh, shield, if you will, for our, for our warfighters. So uh, for defensive applications, you know, there are a lot of different um, targets you might think of. Um, you know, you could be shooting down air targets, drones, missiles, rockets, artilleries, mortars, and the like. And that could be from uh, land vehicles, surface ships, submarines, uh, or even lasers on air platforms to defend themselves against mm -hmm. uh, surface air missiles. Um, you know, you might think of an HPM system at a checkpoint, for example, where you might have a speeding car coming in at a checkpoint or a gate, and you might want to stop that engine uh, very quickly uh, before it reaches its destination. Uh, and you can think of using either HEL or HPM weapons on top of, uh, to stop a small boat from coming too close to the ship, mm. for example. You know, for offensive applications, you know, you have dazzling uh, sensors you could use uh, with a laser. Uh, you, you have uh, Air Force Special Operations Command that is in the process of integrating a 60 kilowatt laser system on an AC-130 gunship. 
uh, to be swapped out with a 30 millimeter uh, gun that's currently on board and that works being led by the team down at Dahlgren. Uh, another offensive application would be an airborne electronic attack with an HPM uh, device mounted in a cruise missile, for example, like what the Air Force did uh, with their CHAMP demonstration. Um, you know, you have the lethal and non-lethal aspects as well. Okay. Uh, you know, when you have the counter material, uh, most of what I talked about um, is a uh, kind of counter material lethal uh, application of direct energy where you're actually damaging or burning out systems uh, that you're shooting at. Um, and a non lethal antimaterial would be, for example, if you use HPM to disrupt the computer network without actually damaging the equipment. For anti personnel applications of direct energy, um, you know, for lasers, dazzling, as I've mentioned, might be the, the easiest one to talk about there, but for, uh, another non-lethal anti-personnel direct energy capability that the U S military developed for crowd control is the active denial system. Okay. So that, uh, basically uses uh, radio frequency millimeter wave, uh, energy at 95 gigahertz to penetrate 164th of uh, the skin, which is basically where all your nerve receptors are. Mm. And it produces kind of an instantaneous intolerable heating sensation that basically causes an adversary to flee. You know, and I've stood in front of the system, I got hit with it. And believe me, uh, if you get hit with it, uh, you absolutely will stop what you were doing. <laughs> and whatever you thought you were gonna do is not what you're gonna do. Uh, but, you know, that being said, a tremendous amount of research was done by AFRL in Albuquerque and the Air Force 711 test wing to ensure that it truly was a reversible process. In other words, there was no residual damage uh, to the person. It was very hot, but no actual damage. So it made it very uh, well suited for perimeter control, crowd control. We're mounting in a helicopter, for example, uh, to stop a, a small vessel from aggressive behavior. And there's actually an office uh, in DOD called the Joint Intermediate Force Capabilities Office, JIFCO. It's formerly the Joint Only for Weapons Directorate uh, located in uh, Marine Corps Base, Quantico, Virginia, and they are responsible for overseeing that program. So, um, you know, for, for uh, you know, Artificial intelligence, you know, where that may come into play uh, with these capabilities um, is that, um, you know, they're, they're going to start working their way in. Um, you know, it's a new capability. Everybody's talking about it. A lot of folks are concerned about it. But, you know, the threats that, that the warfighter faces and will continue to face um, to a growing degree are going to require extremely short decision time. And, uh, you know, it's going to exceed their capacity to do the necessary weapon target pairing uh, in the time that they have to make that decision. And what that weapon target pairing means, if you have all these capabilities, D, direct energy, electronic warfare, kinetic, then you have incoming threats, you have to pair your defensive system up with a particular threat to engage it. So in a very complex battle space, you can imagine that it could become very difficult if you have multiple threats coming in to be able to select this missile for that threat, this direct energy laser for that threat, this microwave weapon for that threat. So, the, so trying to wrap your head around what those battle staffs will be facing real time is where things like the AI and the ML are gonna start coming into play, right? Because that's gonna help them uh, with that decision-making. There'll be sensors out there, that information will be processed very quickly. And then the idea is to keep the human on the loop is the terminology, which means they still monitor the process uh, to ensure that a human is still in charge. Because I think there's a lot of folks out there that are concerned that if we have all these autonomous weapon systems that we might lose control of them, for example. So that there is a desire to keep to keep those humans uh, on the loop. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, we're just now starting to, to feel these, these capabilities uh, and develop that, uh, that warfighter feedback process that's going to guide future acquisitions, uh, which I think is going to be very important as we, as we move forward, uh, because it's not just these standalone capabilities, but it's, it's actually our ability to integrate them. Uh, that is going to be um, going to move the needle the most, I think. And in fact, uh, to quote uh, Secretary of Defense James Mattis, 
You know, he said, success does not go to the country that develops a new technology first, but rather the one to better integrate it mm -hmm. and more swiftly adapt its way of fighting. So that's kind of um, what, we're, what we're at. Gotcha. And, and, and continuing along those lines, as you're integrating these new tools, the, the sort of the whole ethical, philosophical discussion comes into play around the use of them, uh, regulations, uh, treaties, and so forth. Could you talk a little bit about some of the things that you talk about, uh, discuss uh, in relation to these topics. And then also as a second part of that, we, we discussed offline, uh, you introduced me to um, uh, the topic of a gray zone conflict. Uh, and I was reading a little bit about this sort of offline and sort of the, the SOCOM's definition of, uh, you know, if you have a spectrum where diplomacy is on one side and all out war is on another, that these gray zone conflicts are a little sort of closer to the di diplomacy side of things. But um, the potential sort of role, let's say, in gray zone conflicts of these types of tools as opposed to the more, let's say, destructive uh, traditional warfare methods? Certainly. Um, yeah, before getting into uh, to the gray zone, the, the first part of your question, um, you know, you know, I want to kind of be real clear that the U.S. doesn't field uh, weapons without a careful consideration of legal policy treaty compliance related issues. Mm -hmm. That's a given. Uh, we also follow the international rule of uh, armed conflict, which is gives you those kind of customary and generally recognized principles of international law. You know, to include things like the protocol on blinding lasers uh, that was signed in 1980 at the convention of uh, certain conventional weapons, uh, basically prohibiting the fielding of laser weapons that were specifically designed to blind people, right? So and that's been generally adhered to, and, and you hope that it remains adhered to by all parties involved, not just uh, not just us. Um, you know, and additionally, for direct energy weapons in particular, they have a specific review and approval process that they put in place to determine the acceptability, adequacy, and feasibility of these weapon systems within the context of a uh, geographic combatant commander's concept of operations. Because before we feel these capabilities, basically they have to be requested by a combatant command. So we're not just trying to push them out there and, and hope mm -hmm. for the best. Right. You know, there's really a, a, a kind of a, a pretty detailed analysis and process that we go through and a, and a very uh, in-depth discussion between the technology developers and the operational community to make sure that what we are providing them they understand the capabilities and limitations and often the limitations are, are just as important. Uh, and uh, like, like I said, the, the CONOPS and how these things are gonna be used so that, uh, you know, really what we're working towards uh, in this whole community with this very new type of, of weapon that's just hitting the battlefield is we're trying to achieve warfighter confidence, right? We, we want them uh, in the heat of the moment, as we talked about earlier with AI and ML, you know, we want them to select a direct energy weapon because they are confident that it will do mm -hmm. what we told them it would do. So if we have an incoming missile, he doesn't want to just select something because he likes lasers, right? He has an incoming <laughs> missile, it's in self-defense mode, and you want to make darn sure that it's going to be effective. So, but again, so but there's a, there's a, a fairly long drawn out process where a lot of information is, um, is handled, including collateral damage estimates and everything that goes along with kinetic weapons, we do kind of uh, even to a larger degree, I think right now in, in direct energy weapons. So, um, you know, with regard to the gray zone, uh, you know, and this is where I think there may be a distinct advantage uh, for directed energy capabilities in mm -hmm. the gray zone. So, you know, as you mentioned, uh, it is, uh, it, it does reside in, in the competition continuum between cooperation between nations and full on armed conflict. Um, and, and that's a pretty big, pretty big uh, swath, I'd say, uh, of that continuum. Sure. So, you know, you know, an adversary, if you want to call them that in the gray zone, um, you know, they'll take actions specifically designed to stay below uh, a level of violence uh, and a threshold that would trigger response either from America or, or an ally. So they want to they achieve their objectives, 
but they don't want to have it escalate up into an armed conflict, right? So um, they often use proxy or paramilitary forces, uh, allowing governments to maintain some degree of plausible deniability of aggression. Um, you know, recent examples include the uh, Russian annexation of uh, Crimea mm -hmm. and the civil conflict in Ukraine, you know, the so-called uh, Russian little green men. So these would be uh, soldiers with uh, uniform, no insignia and things like that. So they weren't immediately attributable to being Russian. Uh, and then you have the South China Sea island reclamation uh, and building activities where China is seizing land features and claiming them as Chinese territory uh, within the South China Sea. So uh, to do this, to expand on the, the South China Sea a little bit, you know, China uses their Coast Guard and the maritime militia, which is disguised as fishing trawlers, uh, to surge maritime presence at various uh, disputed South China Sea features. And, uh, you know, the difficulty in identifying Chinese fishermen soldiers causes uh, security forces of other countries to act with restraint and avoid using force that might cause injury or death. Uh, and thus, you know, international accusations of human rights abuses. So the so-called CNN effect. Um, so uh, in January of 2019, then uh, the Chief of Naval Operation uh, Operations uh, Admiral Richardson warned uh, his Chinese counterpart that the Navy would treat China's uh, Coast Guard cutters and maritime militia as combatants and uh, respond to provocation by those vessels in the same way that we would respond to provocations by uh, by Navy war by uh, Chinese Navy warships. So um, you know that kind of escalates things a little bit. Uh, the, the question, though, immediately comes into play is what would be considered a proportional response? Mm -hmm. And proportional response is a key aspect of the law of armed conflict. Uh, so, um, you know, if, if, a, if a Chinese maritime militia fishing trawler is doing something we don't like, uh, is it really proportional to, to sink it with a five inch gun, for example? Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's where the kinetic energies kind of fall short in the gray zone, uh, because, uh, you know, obviously sinking that fishing boat would not be good. So if you think about direct energy capabilities, both microwaves and lasers, um, you know, the way these trawlers are outfitted, they have, commu you know, com complex communication equipment, they uh, function in a very coordinated fashion. Um, they're, you know, they have, they have reinforced hulls and, and water cannons and other things, and they've rammed, for example, Vietnamese fishing ships and sunk them, you know, uh, claiming it was an accident. Um, but, you know, when you start to think now about if we bring direct energy uh, capabilities in the mix, we could use, you know, high power microwave uh, uh, weapons, for example, to uh, to disrupt their communication, so that would keep them from operating in a coordinated fashion. Fashion, we could use lasers to um, to uh, disable uh, sensors and communication gear, or even disable ships without uh, hurting individuals. Um, you know, and basically sow confusion and make the effectiveness of their maritime militia much less. Um, and and in doing so by using these kinds of capabilities in that fashion, it basically avoids the so-called CNN effect and we wouldn't be sinking any, any, uh, any ships or, or inadvertently killing any uh, militiamen. Dave, um, at, at the beginning, uh, you know, of the show, you, you gave an introduction about how um, a lot of these themes, which maybe several years ago seemed like science fiction are now you know, active parts of the of the defensive and offensive portfolio now of the armed forces. Um, but obviously there's some still some stuff there that is uh, more sci-fi. Uh, and I thought it'd be a little fun to have a little round here of uh, what we'll call, will science fiction become science fact? Um, and we have a range of stuff here on the list. And I just I'd like to start off with the, the, on the, on the small end of things, which all of you know, my kids love, which I loved as a kid, uh, and going back to Star Trek and just the, the theme of the, the handheld laser, the, the phaser. Obviously, you know, our police officers carry sidearms, carry tasers. Um, 
issues with both of them. Uh, technologically, uh, do you ever foresee uh, the development of actually miniaturized, handheld, directed energy weapons in the hands of police officers, uh, either to uh, prevent or to disable or stun versus uh, a, lot, you know, a lot of the issues that we have when someone unloads a magazine against uh, a, a suspect today. Yeah, um, interesting question. So, I mean, we have things today like tasers, for example, right? right. So that's a, that's a direct connection, electrical discharge. Um, that, that creates that effect. Uh, you know, this notion of a handheld laser system uh, to be used against humans, for example, in this case, uh, you'd have to ask, you know, what is your desired uh, outcome <laughs> from that engagement? So, um, you know, I don't really see handheld lasers being anything more than, um, than dazzlers at this point, okay. right? So basically, you know, you can dazzle sight, which is pretty effective, and you want to do it in such a way that you're not going to damage, damage the eye, right? Um, on the microwave side, uh, we're starting to see some interesting systems come out. They tend to be more uh, electronic warfare oriented, so they're a little more, they're lower power and more finesse in terms of how they interact with targets like drones. And those, they are developing handheld things that kind of look like, like guns. But um, personally, I think we're uh, a fairly long way away from anything that would approach uh, a handheld, you know, just due to the size, weight, power, cooling kinds of constraints that go along with systems. And as I opened up with, you know, ultimately it depends on what it is you're trying to do, right? Because that'll drive you back to what the system has to be. Okay. Getting a little bigger now, um, seeing some things in the news, uh, well, research news in, in recent months about space-based sources of power uh, so that we can capture some type of energy uh, above the atmosphere and in certain ways, whether it's laser, electromagnetic methods, uh, beam it down to, to some type of resource on the planet that can, can extract that energy. Uh, your thoughts on space-based uh, sources of energy and directed energy for getting it to us on, on the terrestrial side? Um, well, I mean, I guess it depends, right? So uh, there is advantages to collecting solar power uh, in, in space due to the uh, lack of atmospheric absorption uh, and, and increased efficiency of the collection process. Uh, but when you're talking about uh, transferring that energy back down to Earth, um, you know, I've seen concepts where they talk about using microwave energy. Uh, but as I talked about, you know, that spreading process uh, is pretty significant. And the ranges we're talking about are, are extremely significant. So the power density on the ground would probably be pretty small for anything that could reasonably be fielded. Um, Lasers, you know, what you have to look at is the entire efficiency of the process. So what's the efficiency of the light collection? What's the efficiency of the laser generation? And then what's the efficiency of the laser propagation back down to earth? And then ultimately what's the efficiency of the detection on earth to convert it back to electricity? And I, I don't see that in the, in the near term being, being viable, uh, you know, our, um, you know, our, as, as the swap C, the size, weight, power, and cooling of these systems goes down, mm -hmm. uh, it does make them look more attractive to space applications because it's expensive basically to get mass up into orbit. Um, but uh, the distances uh, are, are great, you know, in space, right? Yeah. So while uh, on Earth, we have to worry about how lasers propagate through the Earth's atmosphere and how do you compensate for that or deal with that uh, in the system design. Uh, in space, you don't have that because there isn't much atmospheric effect in space. Um, but the distance is so long, you start to drive requirements back into the, the technical capabilities of the system and how well are you able to hold a spot and those kinds of things, so. 
that's where I think we are with that. Okay, and then the, the last one on this list, uh, looking in the opposite direction now, um, we've seen different initiatives over the last couple of years. Uh, one was a, a company called uh, Escape Dynamics. They actually went out of business. They were looking at electromagnetic powered space planes. Uh, and then uh, Avi Loeb, who we had from um, on the show a couple of months ago from Harvard, uh, he's involved in this uh, breakthrough initiative, sort of the Starshot project and sort of developing little laser uh, spaceships, let's say, or say sales, whatever you want to call it, to, you know, get us elsewhere uh, faster uh, once we're off the planet. Your thoughts about um, electromagnetic or laser-based uh, aero, uh, sort of space propulsion technologies for the future? So, yeah, I mean, I've, I've been in some of the Starshot meetings uh, in the past. Um, and, you know, certainly a very interesting concept. Uh, one thing I will say as a as an engineer and maybe as a nuke, I, I can't shake is I tend to be somewhat of a pragmatist when it comes to uh, to uh, concepts. So what I would need to understand, because the numbers I heard talked about um, really had a pretty significant uh, requirement on the laser power that would have to be generated terrestrially and beamed towards this uh, this laser sail, as they call it, okay. um, to accelerate it to the to the closest uh, star, I guess, in our galaxy. So, um, so I don't have a good understanding because because what I heard on the sizes of the sail was grams, handfuls of grams, mm -hmm. and I know there's a lot going on with in terms of miniaturization, uh, but you know you. Uh, the, the idea is the sail travels uh, to the star and the, and the nearby planet and then sends back images uh, to Earth. Well, you know, to me, when I think about things like that, that requires power generation on the sail. It requires an antenna to beam that energy back. It requires sensitive receivers on Earth or even in a satellite uh, to detect it. So I haven't done the calculations on that whole link margin associated with that process, but it seems fairly daunting. I mean, exciting, the whole notion of trying to get some information back from a nearby star and planet would be, you know, because the idea is this planet is it's about the size of Earth. It's about the same distance from the star and they mm -hmm. think that it could sustain life, right? So that's kind of why they want to go there. Um, Certainly as, a, as an engineer, the notion of making this large bank of very high power uh, continuous wave lasers, or even you might get away with pulse lasers, uh, certainly is uh, exciting. Um, you probably would have to use pulse lasers because, you know, lasers are, say, roughly 30% efficient, right? Mm -hmm. Which means if you want one kilowatt out, you have to put three kilowatts in, okay. right? And then you have to cool two kilowatts, right? Which takes more power. So, um, you know, if you're talking about megawatt lasers and then multiple megawatt lasers, you know, it's like how many megawatts are we talking about and what kind of power plant do you need on earth to power them? So not to, not to rain on anybody's parade, but you know, I would, my approach would just simply be to kind of look at the numbers and, and, uh, and see what it makes sense. But certainly it, it sounds like an exciting concept. You have a lot, a lot of, uh, a lot of thought to the next generation uh, for uh, for things they can be working on. Um, but along those lines, um, we have you know, a lot of young folks in the audience uh, as well um, that uh, are going to be listening to this, and um, obviously not just want to do what you do, but want to sort of become the next uh, Dr. David Stout, um, follow sort of in your path to some of these amazing uh, concepts, projects, things that we're saying transitioning from the sci-fi to the, uh, the reality. Um, take a little time if you would, just um, recommendations, suggestions for sort of the next generation that's coming along, whether they're graduating high school now or sort of early on in college, sort of seeking uh, what direction to go. They're listening to you down like, wow, this is really cool stuff. Uh, suggestions for uh, folks that wanna get into this space uh, and, and follow your path. Sure. And, and I guess actually before I answer that question, I might want to go off script a little Please. bit because 
Well, you know, one thing we've we've talked a lot about is uh, what capabilities are we developing, right? Uh, and I, I do want to raise at least a growing concern I have, and and that is that the U.S. is not the only country developing these capabilities, right? So, you know, one thing I think needs more attention is that we need to look at this emerging threat, right? If we just kind of flip it and say, okay, let's say uh, China or Russia or some other potential adversary develops these capabilities, how might they use them against us? And then I just think we want to ensure that, um, that those adversary capabilities can't negate our exquisite weapon systems, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, so, you know, I'd like to see more attention played on the defensive side of things. And then additionally, you know, as the world becomes more digital, uh, as systems become more automated, as vehicles start driving themselves down the road without a driver, you know, and as the uh, Internet of Things covers the world in what I'll call an electronic crust, right? Uh, we want to make sure that we're not building a significant weakness into our society that could be exploited either by criminals or by adversary nations, right? I mean, Cold War threats like uh, nuclear-generated EMP, you detonate a nuclear bomb up in the upper atmosphere, yep. puts a large electromagnetic pulse in the ground. I mean, that's real, and I think it should be considered, and in fact, uh, it was enough of a concern by Congress that the need to have our civilian infrastructure, you know, address that nuclear EMP threat was actually written into the 2020 National Defense Authorization Act. So, you know, you know, when they think about infrastructures and power distribution and everything, uh, you know, that's that's I would call that the uh, the electric crust, if you will. But now this uh, this the IoT, the Internet of Things, is becoming this kind of mesh in between all that that I think increasingly over time, uh, we're gonna become heavily dependent on. So I just think that these kinds of capabilities need to be kept in mind uh, in the future by the folks developing those capabilities. So um, now in answer to your question uh, to, to folks out there uh, that might be interested in this area, you know, I talked about uh, the topics I studied uh, at ODU, uh, mostly in the physical sciences uh, realm, the high power mm -hmm. electromagnetic, solid state laser physics, uh, gases, electronics, pulse power, fast diagnostics. Uh, and now, as we've talked about, you know, you have artificial intelligence, machine learning, you have augmented virtual reality, you have quantum computing, digital engineering, and many others that are eventually going to start being incorporated into, uh, into warfare. Um, and certainly, you know, the trick's going to be how do we integrate these communities together? Um, you know, the uh, augmented reality is already starting to take place in terms of training. How do we train our operators? How to use capabilities more effectively? Um, and you know, and as a fellow and president of, of uh, DEPS, the Director of Professional Society, of course, I would recommend joining DEPS. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, participating in the many classified and unclassified conferences we have, short courses, educational or outreach activities uh, that we do are easy to find. It's just deps.org, D-E-P-S.org. Um, DEPS offers graduate uh, direct energy scholarships. Um, and we uh, offer internships and capstone projects to both undergraduate and graduate students at U.S. colleges and universities. Um, there are a number of programs uh, in government laboratories, such as Naval Service Warfare Center in Dahlgren, uh, Naval Research Lab in Washington, Air Force Research Lab in Albuquerque, Space and Missile Defense Command in Huntsville, Alabama, and many others. And then there are a lot of uh, large companies uh, that are supporting the development of direct energy as well, Booz Allen being one of them, mm -hmm. Lockheed, Raytheon, Northrop, you know, General Atomics, and many others. So, you know, what I you know, tell, tell uh, folks at Dahlgren and anybody that wants to listen is, uh, you know, I would suggest that you always stay focused on the, on the why, right? Sure. Why am I developing the weapon systems? Who's going to benefit from them? There's a great book by Simon Sinek, Start With Why. I highly recommend uh, folks read. You know, and then finally, uh, I want to say uh, a few words about mentorship. Please. Uh, you know, I had some great mentors over the years. Um, 
that uh, had a significant positive impact on the trajectory of my career. I mentioned Dr. Carl Schoenbach was one. Uh, Dr. Bill Graham, former presidential science advisor to Ronald Reagan, mm -hmm. uh, another. Uh, Dr. Jim Colvard had many positions in the Navy, including the technical director of Dahlgren and the deputy of Office of Personnel Management for President Reagan. Um, Lieutenant General uh, Bob Schweitzer, uh, who uh, was a retired Army three-star general, uh, also a former military advisor to, to Reagan when he was president. Uh, and Bob worked with me uh, when I was running a defensively focused HPM program. So again, looking at what other countries were developing and how might we, you know, mitigate those effects, you know, and many, and many more. So, you know, if you're a senior person in your field, uh, you know, I highly recommend you reach out to those younger energetic folks and provide them guidance and, and lessons learned. You know, and if you're uh, new to your field, uh, whatever it is, you know, seek out those who are more experienced and be receptive to learning from them. You know, I guess the old adage is there's a reason why we have, uh, you know, two ears and, and one mouth, right? You know, it's, it's to really kind of listen and learn and grow. So that's that's kind of what I would have as, as, as advice, I guess. Great messages. Great message. Really appreciate that, especially on the mentorship is extremely important the theme that we like to get into. Um, Dave, I, I, one, one final question. Um, I, I, uh, I typically, I typically give the bio of uh, the guests I have on this show to my kids, uh, just <laughs> because they really think uh, I, I, they like they love cool topics like this. Uh, see if they come up with anything uh, out of the blue that uh, that I didn't think of. And my, my fourteen year old daughter had an awesome. I, I was what, I, she brought this up. I was like, I don't know. I'll have to ask. Um, has has anyone ever uh, used the active denial system to cook something larger than can fit in a traditional microwave oven? A turkey, <laughs> a large side of beef. It's a, <laughs> it, it, it's a, it's a great question. Um, and, and I'll try not to give too technical an answer. Um, so when you think about the, uh, the microwave oven in your kitchen, Right, which is what she's referring to. Absolutely. So that is uh, that that has a, a magnetron, a device in it that creates RF energy, and it does so at um, two point four five gigahertz, right? Okay. And the minus nine hertz, right? Uh, and the reason that frequency is chosen because it tends to be a resonant frequency of water molecules, which comprise a lot of things in food. So yeah. that way, there's good coupling and oscillates to those molecules. It creates heat and cooks the food. Um, the difference between that and uh, the active denial system, which operates at 95 gigahertz, okay. so it's called a millimeter wave um, uh, weapon because the wavelength is very small. So uh, the penetration depth, as I said, uh, is 1 64th of an inch. Hmm. So that would not result in a very tasty food coming out of your microwave. You know, you would not have this nice, uh, I mean, if you put it on there long enough, sure, you're going to cause damage, right? Much longer than what you would ever do in an operational context, but you'd end up with a, a crusty skin on a cold piece of meat. <laughs> <laughs> Standing, and uh, so we'll we'll stick with the traditional. Uh, we'll stick with the traditional oven for that one. I'll relay that to her. Good but, question, uh, man. Good question. I, I, I figure I'd be. <laughs> I look forward uh, to seeing her in depth, and, and one day when she gets a little older. One day, one day, <laughs> uh, Dave. It's 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 been really fascinating uh, listening to everything you're doing and, and hearing about your journey, and um, really wishing you the best with all of this moving forward, especially now in, in the private sector and continuing to cons consult and provide leadership. And, and guidance on all these fronts. Um, for, for everybody that's going to be listening to this particular episode uh, or watching uh, on the YouTube channel, you've been listening to Dr. David Stout, a Senior Executive Advisor and Engineering Fellow for Directed Energy at Booz Allen Hamilton, also President of the Directed Energy Professional Society. Uh, Dave, again, I, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to do this. Thank you for sharing uh, the extreme amount of knowledge that you shared with us. Uh, thank you for your service to our country. Uh, and as we say on the show, thank you for helping to create a better tomorrow uh, via the development of these uh, new concepts, these new technologies. It was really uh, a great honor meeting you. And, and thank you, Ira. I uh, definitely appreciate the invitation. And it's, it was fun to kind of reminisce and, and kind of go through things. And hopefully some folks get some use out of it. Absolutely. Will do.